What's up, future respiratory therapists? In this video, I'm gonna tell you why you cannot tell me that your patient presents with respiratory failure. That doesn't tell me anything. There's two different types. Let's dive in. All right, so we know we're talking about respiratory failure today, and the key here is to recognize that respiratory failure tells me nothing, okay? And here's why. There are two different types of respiratory failure. There is type one and there is type two respiratory failure. And Egan's edition 12, chapter 45, outlines it clearly. Now, Egan's goes in to indications and therapies and treatments of. This video is just focusing on the identification of type one versus type two respiratory failure. And what does that tell you about your patient? Now, type one, let's talk about that first. Type 1 respiratory failure, you're going to look at your PaO2. And Egan says that anytime your PaO2 is less than 60 millimeters of mercury, then this is identified as type 1 respiratory failure. Egan also goes on to say that this is also known as hypoxemic respiratory failure. You see, the problem here is that this patient is having a hard time oxygenating. And if you haven't already picked up on this notion that ventilation, the removal of CO2 versus oxygenation, bringing in oxygen and adequate levels of oxygen are two different, sometimes combined, but also can be independent from each other, then you're behind the game because today's video is all about those two things happening separate. So type one, you're looking at your PaO2, less than 60, also called hypoxemic respiratory failure. Now type two, when we talk about that, we're gonna be talking about our arterial CO2, and that's anytime it's greater than 50 millimeters of mercury. When it is greater than 50 millimeters of mercury, then you're looking at type two respiratory failure. Now we're not gonna treat all these the same because as we're gonna see here in a little bit, you can have different types of type two respiratory failure. Type two respiratory failure can also be referred to as hypercapnic respiratory failure. You may also hear this referred to as acute ventilatory failure. So you can see here, Type 1 relates to oxygen, type 2 relates to CO2. They mean different things and we got to be on board and clear. When we tell somebody your patient presents with respiratory failure, you're telling them specifically which type of respiratory failure, okay? Now, you may be thinking to yourself, okay, well, how do I remember these, Joe? Like, give me a secret. Make it simple for me, right? Well, think, type 1 is talking about O2. There's only one letter. In O2. Type 2 refers to CO2. There are two letters in CO2. And that's an easy way you could remember type 1 versus type 2 related to respiratory failure. Okay, now let's dive in a little deeper and let's look at uh, type 1 respiratory failure, which we know is also hypoxemic respiratory failure. When we look at our pH, we see that we have a high pH with a low CO2. So this is high. This is low. Now, there is obviously a disturbance amongst our ventilation. We are getting rid of too much CO2. That's not the same. Remember, type 2 respiratory failure was talking about a high CO2, not a low CO2, and we'll explain this more in just a second. The problem is right here. We have a reduced PaO2, less then 60 millimeters of mercury, and this patient presents with type 1 respiratory failure. This is going to be indicative or for the need for supplemental oxygen, maybe non-invasive therapy, maybe mechanical ventilation. Egan's goes further into it, into describing and having to assess the A to A gradient and the PF ratio to make an accurate decision on what intervention needs to be done. But for right now, we can clearly recognize that this is hypoxemic respiratory failure because the O2 is the problem. Now, remember I told you, this also is 
abnormal. The CO2 is down, the pH is up. Well, here's why. This patient is hyperventilating. Their CO2 is going down, their pH is going up. Why are they hyperventilating? In response to the hypoxemic respiratory failure. The peripheral chemoreceptors are now kicking in and saying, hey, you need to breathe more because we need more oxygen. And that's why your CO2 is down and that's why your pH is up. Now, you don't have to have this presentation. Maybe they present with a normal CO2 and a normal pH, but most likely not. We learned in our disease class that most diseases begin with alveolar hyperventilation, a de-reduction in CO2 leading to a high pH because most diseases begin with a hypoxemic component. And that's type one respiratory failure when looking at a blood gas. Now, let's look at type two respiratory failure when looking at a blood gas. Now we see a high CO2 greater than 50 we see a reduced pH. This pH is acidotic. So this is an acidosis that is present. We have a normal PaO2, and maybe it's not always normal, but for right now we have a normal PaO2. We have a normal bicarb. This just says we're starting from a normal state, okay? So this patient, 100% is failing to effectively remove carbon dioxide. That's gonna cause their CO2 to go up, their pH to go down, and we can say that this person is in acute ventilatory failure. Type two respiratory failure, AKA hypercapnic respiratory failure. Now the problem is, is that it gets more complicated from here. Because when we look at this next slide, we're gonna see two different situations where the CO2 is greater than 50. Let's look here. This is the same blood gas we just looked at. We have a high CO2 greater than 50 causing an acidosis. Our PaO2 doesn't matter. It's normal. Our bicarb, normal. These don't matter in this discussion. Now, when you compare that to the second set of blood gases over here, you can see that we have a CO2 greater than 50 causing a normal pH. So wait a second, how do we have a high CO2 and a normal pH? Well, that's because our bicarb has increased to fully compensate for this elevated CO2. Our PaO2 is mildly hypoxemic. That's not the discussion right now. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. So what's the difference between these two? Well, the difference is this. This blood gas is an acute hypercapnic respiratory failure, an acute type two respiratory failure, where this blood gas is a chronic hypercapnic respiratory failure. One of these patients needs help. One of them needs the assistance for mechanical ventilation. It's not this one, because this person lives like this because they live at this chronic state of an elevated CO2. So that pH being normal tells you that this is their baseline. They live with chronic type two respiratory failure. Now the other one over here, acute type two respiratory failure, this person needs help to get rid of this CO2 to help bring this pH back up. Okay, so that's how you can recognize the difference between acute and chronic type two respiratory failure or acute versus chronic ventilatory failure, also known as acute versus chronic hypercapnic failure. You gotta be prepared to hear these terms thrown your way in a bunch of different ways, okay? And so acute versus chronic, help this patient ventilate Understand that this is this patient's normal and we're not going to, to do anything here. Now, having said that, let's talk specifically about chronic type two respiratory failure. Because what we know coming out of Egan's chapters 45 is that these patients commonly can present with an elevated CO2 greater than 50 as well as a PaO2 less than 60. So when you're talking about your chronic patients, 
Don't be surprised if they live at a chronic state of both type 1 and type 2 respiratory failure. A chronic state of hypoxemia as well as a chronic state of hypercapnia. Okay, this is going to be normal. We're okay with this. Let's support this patient where they are. And the reason they're here is because their bicarb has elevated to fully compensate for the pH. Now, what we know is that this person right here can become impacted by an exacerbation, an acute disease process such as pneumonia or uh, a, a, a lower respiratory infection can cause this person's state of chronic ventilatory failure to become altered. And what that's going to look like is we're going to see that their CO2 is going to go up higher. So they live at a CO2 of 70, 71, 72, but now look, their CO2 has elevated. When that elevates, your pH is going to go down. This disease process, this acute problem, has also caused their PaO2 to go further down. And their bicarb, baseline was 36, is still 36. This tells you that they live at a state of chronic ventilatory failure. But this acidotic pH says there is acute ventilatory failure present meaning their CO2 is higher than what it normally is. And this is what we call acute ventilatory failure superimposed on chronic ventilatory failure. This person needs help getting rid of that CO2 and getting their O2 up. This person lives at this state and we're just going to support their normal state. That's the difference between chronic ventilatory failure, oftentimes accompanied with type 1 and type 2 respiratory failure, but it is their baseline, so it's chronic ventilatory failure. When they go further south on their PaO2 and up on their CO2, their pH becomes acidotic. This is acute ventilatory failure superimposed on chronic ventilatory failure. This is how you have to look and treat these patients. How do I know if I'm going to mechanically ventilate this patient? How do I know when I'm back to their baseline? You'll know when you get back to a normal pH. That tells you that's the level for which they live. Because remember, bicarb doesn't move quickly to start to compensate. So an acute problem, should it last long enough, for bicarb compensation. And that's why it's the same. That's acute ventilatory failure superimposed on chronic ventilatory failure. You have got to be able to recognize this, okay? Still type two respiratory failure, still type one respiratory failure, but tied into and put on top of a chronic state, okay? Now, the last thing <clears throat> that Egan's talks about is that do not be shocked that if a lot of your patients present with both, because we know that hypoventilation, hypoventilation can lead to hypoxemia. So when you have a patient who is hypoventilating, their CO2 will go up, their pH will go down. This is the type 2 component. This is the, the hypercapnic component of the respiratory failure. The PaO2 has now also decreased. This is the type 1 component. This is the hypoxemic component. And guess what? We see from a normal state that our bicarb falls within a normal range. So you know that this person does not live with a high CO2. They do not live with a low PaO2. Both of these are out of range and you have a patient presenting with type 1 and type 2 respiratory failure, hypoxemic and hypercapnic respiratory failure. This person needs assistance in getting rid of the CO2 to restore the pH as well as increasing the oxygenation for this patient. And that's where we come down to. And that's the summary of this.
Remember, a PaO2 less than 60 millimeters of mercury is type 1 respiratory failure, hypoxemic respiratory failure. A CO2 greater than 50 is type 2 respiratory failure, hypercapnic respiratory failure. And then we break that down into acute versus chronic respiratory failure or acute ventilatory failure versus chronic ventilatory failure. And then of course we can always have acute ventilatory failure superimposed on chronic ventilatory failure. And if you want to know how to reach out to me, you can do so right here. Find me on Instagram at respiratory coach, TikTok at respiratory coach, Twitter at coach RRT. Send me an email to respiratory coach at gmail.com. I would love to interact with you via email. And if you're interested in joining my texting platform, 817-968 7035. I don't do a lot here, but I do occasionally send out motivational, inspirational, educational content via text messaging through this platform. Just another way to promote, enhance, collaborate with all RTs to promote the profession moving forward. I hope this makes sense. Hope you always remember that average is easy. It's so easy. It's up to you not to be it.